McDonough. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. Um, Tom, <laughs> Tom is a writer and critic based in central New York and Toronto. He writes extensively on contemporary art with recent and forthcoming essays devoted to chow. How do I pronounce that? Cafe? Caufe? Chowfei. The Astor Gates. Oh, God, you have all these hard things to pronounce. Isa Genskin, Eileen Quinlan, Wolf, uh, Wolfgang Tillmann, and Christopher Williams. His most recent book is Boredom, uh, which was published this year. So here's Tom McDonough. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. And uh, thank you to the Barnes for the invitation. And thank you, um, my colleagues who are speaking it, it, it here today. It's really um, such a pleasure and an honor. And especially for someone whose last book is um, titled Boredom. I mean, it's a risk for all of you, I suppose. Uh, 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 but I will. I mean, I have to say, you know, I, I, I always wonder when I get up here on the stage, like, why did I choose to speak about the thing that I'm about to talk with you about? Because, I mean, I'm neither going to show you uh, lovely, you know, 19th century impressionist and post-impressionist painting, nor am I going to guide you, you know, eloquently to works upstairs. I'm going to talk about a contemporary artist who's not featured in the exhibition. Um, so maybe what I would say is something like, uh, what I want to think with you about today is, what I could describe as a maybe a limit case of Flannery, a, a limit case of some of the some of the conditions that we've been addressing uh, today. But like everyone else, you know, I mean, I gotta start. You know, where are you gonna start on Flannery? Okay, here we are. You know, sure. It's just a th it's just a throwaway. But um, no, so maybe we could begin here um, in the 1860s, when French poet Charles Baudelaire penned what we might call the essential project of the flaneur in the twelfth of his prose poems collected in a small volume known as uh, Paris Spleen. The piece, titled Crowds, opens with the famous line, it's not given to everyone to take a bath of multitude. Enjoying the crowd is an art. I mean, I think we could say that to, to, to bathe in the multitude is indeed the form of urban pleasure, artistry even, established by the flaneur of the great European metropolises of the mid-19th century and carried forward as a search for the marvelous by the surrealists, those avant-garde explorers of the 1920s and 30s, only perhaps to reach its apogee in the so-called derive, those aimless exploratory urban drifts of the situationists in post-war Paris. You see, I mean, already boredom is taking a grip, you know, it's a danger. Baudelaire, uh, Breton, Debord, all knew how to take their pleasure among the masses, to revel in the vicarious carnality of the street. But to pursue the analogy first developed in crowds, while such baths may be uh, luxuriant or they may be bracing, one thing they all share is that we at some point leave them. We lift ourselves out of the water, dry off, and resume the business of the day. The position of the flaneur depended, that is to say, on the ability precisely to depart from the crowd, to return to the solitude proper to one's literary or artistic vocation, and translate the experience of this ineffable orgy, I'm speaking of Flannery, not the, uh, not the, the symposium today, uh, the experience of this ineffable orgy into polished words or images. To be a flaneur was to be in, I mean, maybe this is polemic in, the, in the, 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 the context of today, but I'd say that to be a flaneur was to be in, but not truly of the crowd. But what of the other term in Baudelaire's definition? What about the multitude itself? How might it come to visibility through modes of artistic practice? Beyond the exemplary individuality of the flaneur, are there means by which such collectivities take shape? So rather than tracing some contemporary reformulation of modernity's solitary urban wandering then, I'd like to take some time this afternoon to explore one possible 
response to these questions. Questions posed, we might say, from the perspective of the crowd itself in the work of contemporary French artist Philippe Perrenaud. Now, Perrenaud might, might not be a particularly obvious choice. Uh, he, you know, he's likely known to many of you here in the audience, well known here, in fact, in Philadelphia, as the scenarist of the Philadelphia Museum of Art's remarkable 2012 exhibition, Dancing Around the Bride. So you, you may think of him as an inheritor of the 20th century legacy of Duchamp that has so marked him and many of his contemporaries. Others may recall that his early work was considered an exemplar of the so-called relational aesthetics of the 1990s, structured more around informal participation than the finished object. But I've chosen Perrano because crowds have long been central figures in his art, appearing variously under the guise of demonstrators, uh, party goers, consumers, spectators, or mourners, as presence, or more often as structuring absence, even if they've been rarely acknowledged as such by his commentators. From his early performative works to more recent installations, he's consistently returned to the figuration of diverse forms of collectivity and provisional community in a contemporary moment marked by the crisis of the public sphere. Not the flaneur then, for whom the crowd can only be an image in which to take delight, but rather, in some conditional manner, the struggle for the contemporary mass to find a representation of itself. That's my subject today. So to begin, I, I think it's not too great an exaggeration to claim that Perrano's work begins with a staged demonstration. No More Reality, La Manifestation of 1991, is frequently regarded as one of the earliest successful realizations of the artist's mature concerns. For it, Perreno enlisted the assistance of young students between the ages of seven and eight from a primary school in Nice. A workshop on protest marches determined a set of demands that these kids wanted, right? Uh, Christmas celebrations to be held in September. I think we could all agree on that. Snow commanded for the summer. As a resident of upstate New York, I'd say, to hell with that, no, thank you. I mean, we already, it's already a possibility. So anyway, they have these, you know, kind of utopian childlike demands, all uh, announced under this overarching slogan, no more reality, which the children perhaps tellingly chose for its resemblance to the ubiquitous Nike advertising catchphrase, just do it. And I mean, as an aside, you might recall that the uh, just do it tagline introduced way back in 1988 by advertising firm Whedon and Kennedy quickly became an instantly recognizable global emblem of the Nike brand. The fact that Dan Whedon based it on the last words of serial killer Gary Gilmore, his 1977 remark, let's do it to the firing squad about to execute him, may reveal something about the necrotic character of late capital itself. A short video documenting this performance protest shows the children parading in the school's verdant playground, shouting their slogan and carrying banners on which it's inscribed. They're happy to be out of class on a sunny day, enjoying the fine weather in their shorts and t-shirts. They're charming, well-groomed kids, clearly the offspring of solid middle-class denizens of the French Riviera. We sense something vaguely parodic in the artist's intent in his substituting of these children and their mischievous demands for the serious adult world of protest. To understand no more reality, we need, however, to set this privileged world against another scene that had transpired in the fall of 1990, just six months or so before the making of Perrineau's video. From early November, high school students had taken to the streets in Paris and other major French cities to protest insufficient funding for education and an atmosphere of insecurity in the schools. Uh, you know, we have persistent problems there to this day. These protests quickly grew in size and scope, culminating in a large-scale so-called National March for Education in Paris on November 12, which attracted around 100,000 high school-age participants. Uh, so you see some, you know, uh, kind of a 
the, the happy version of, the pro, you know, of these uh, November 1990 protests here, this kind of a multi-ethnic, earnest uh, group of young people holding the banner, you know, proclaiming the need to uh, improve funding for their studies. But then there's the, uh, the, the negative side of this as well, let's say. Among the 100,000 protesting on November 12 were groups of so-called casseurs from the working class immigrant suburbs of Paris who looted shops and clashed violently with the police. Uh, you know, a uh, hundred officers were injured, dozens of cars were damaged or lit on fire and destroyed, 91 arrests made that day. If the actions of these predominantly black and Arab youth were decried as much by the official left that had organized the march as by the government and its forces of order, they nevertheless represented a spontaneous violent assertion of a, a right to the city by those who had been regularly chased out of the center of Paris for the previous 20 years. It was the sort of crowd, we might say, most feared by the Parisian bourgeoisie, the return of all it most assiduously attempts to repress or to use the sociological language of the time to exclude. Perrineau's own position toward this crowd was, at the very least, ambiguous. In a later interview, he remembered the events of November 12, 1990 in these terms. Quoting Philippe, he says, uh, some students demonstrated, demonstrated in the streets of France, yelling, money, we want money for better education, whereas other kids sought to profit from the situation by looting the stores for Chevignon jackets and Burberry scarves so that they would have the appearance of being serious about their studies. Now, on one level, Perino seems here to insist on what we might call the equally spectacular quality of these two modalities of protest. Uh, the one chanting its programmed slogans for eager television cameras, the other determined to achieve an image, if only an image, of privilege or distinction, even at the cost of criminality. On another level, however, it's difficult not to hear in such a remark a rather dismissive attitude toward those whose lives and opportunities had long been circumscribed by what Kristen Ross describes as the continuing economic unevenness of those edge spaces, semi-colonies to the metropolis that are the French banlieue, the kind of working class suburbs of the capital. The casseurs in Perrineau's remarks are not part of that virtuous collectivity struggling for a common good, money for better education, but take advantage of the demonstration to advance their self-interested agenda, looting luxury goods as a means to attain what he calls the appearance of being serious about their studies. But I think it's insufficient to simply set the crowd of children in no more reality alongside that of the November 1990 march. I mean, I think a simple comparison here misses something essential. I think we need rather to to triangulate three different formations. Both, that is, need to be mapped alongside a third collective formation. One evoked in a text Perino composed for an exhibition held during that same summer of 1991 when the video No More Reality was first shown. So this is a short text that he writes uh, that reads, uh, Central Park on a Sunday. A crowd of bodies and fashions, rollerblades. It's the early 90s, so you'll, you know, you can picture it. So think of, think of friends, you know, that kind of thing, right? Uh, rollerblades, streamlined helmets, cycling jerseys, and shorts of colors so well studied, they've become a language of their own. Walkman, oh, wow, it's really dated. Walkman headphones plugged into ears. Memories of yesterday's news broadcast on CNN, where you could see GIs crawling across the Saudi sand. Finally, the ground and garbage cans so thoroughly dug through by the homeless that you have the impression while strolling of stepping on their crops or on their meals themselves. This account of the atomized, privatized, mediatized crowd circa 1990 provides us with a broader context for understanding the specificity of the artist's approach to collectivity at this moment. Its sense of unreality in the juxtaposition of youthful rollerbladers with the televisual images of distant war 
and the infinite social distance of the homeless sets Perino's viewpoint in a particular context, I think, in 1990, 1991. Perhaps something that's close to the, the context sketched by Jean Baudrillard in these same months when he was writing the series of journalistic essays that would be assembled in his book, The Gulf War Did Not Take Place. So, I mean, the very time that we're thinking about that Perino's making these videos, writing these texts, uh, you know, Baudrillard, this kind of French uh, hyper-intellectual, I don't know what you call him, pseudo-intellectual, crypto-intellectual, I mean, depends on uh, what you think of the moment. Uh, you know, Baudrillard is publishing this series of editorials in the pages of a French daily paper on uh, the events of the Gulf War. In those essays, Baudrillard, the, the prophet of postmodern hyper-reality, right? Um, he wrote of the aphrodisiac excitement we seek in the multiplication of the false and the hallucination of violence, of our, of our desperate search for what he calls a hallucinogenic pleasure, which is also the pleasure taken in our indifference and our irresponsibility. Perhaps uh, shades of the, the badaud and the flaneur there as well. That kind of indifference and irresponsibility being the very locus of what he calls our true freedom. This, he concludes, is the supreme form of contemporary democracy. Seen in such a light, the cry of no more reality from Perino's child protesters sounds less like the refusal of an oppressive reality principle in the name of emancipatory ludic desublimation than a demand for the more equitable diffusion of those hallucinogenic pleasures endemic to late capital. But the casseur of November 12 cannot simply be assimilated into this dynamic. The violence of their looting of boutiques on the left bank that day had nothing hallucinatory about it, but was rather an insistence on taking the promises, promises of a society of simulation at its word and demanding now the use of all those goods that are proffered to them as mere image. The motto, no more reality, could only mean something very different to them. If politics, as defined by French philosopher Jacques Rancière, is a matter of, as he says, interpreting in the theatrical sense of the word, the gap between a place where the demos, the, the people, exists, and a place where it does not, where there are only populations, individuals, employers, and employees, and so on, then we might say that in this work and this moment of history, the people are not where they appear and appear where they are not. So I mean, I want to map out, I mean, here in this moment, this initial, uh, this initial moment of the early 1990s, a particular ambiguous position on Perino's part, a kind of, um, I mean, it's difficult to shake the, the lingering cynicism and suspicion uh, uh, of this early work. But by the later 1990s, we find Perino explicitly addressing the question of the public, right? a public that for him can only become visible, we might say, as a specter. In a text of these years, he describes the public as a purely anticipatory phenomenon, at least as conjured within the dynamics of a consumer society. So again, he's writing this text, he says, when one has to present a new product, you begin or end up always wanting to anticipate desires. You try to predict what the client who doesn't yet exist will enjoy consuming. These are the basics of marketing based on a myth, the myth of the public. Hitherto, he says, ghosts haunted the places in which they had lived. Now, now, new ghosts appear, the ghosts of consumers who do not yet exist, but who already desire what one seeks to produce for them. These, then, are not the ghosts of Gothic imaginings or of surrealist hauntings not the phantoms that return from a repressed past with all the force of the uncanny, but rather those that return from the future. They are a prefiguration of our as yet unrecognized desires, the, the present absent objects around which a mythical public might cohere. In this instance, it's the force of marketing that conjures forth these spirits. But we could broaden the case to say that all public opinion is spectral in this sense. This was certainly the response offered by Jacques Derrida when asked to define the contemporary meaning of public opinion. 
I mean, a public opinion, we might say, figure that, that haunts all of these debates uh, around spectatorship and, uh, and, and the urban, uh, uh, the quality of the urban in the late 19th century onwards. Um, Derrida, when asked to define in the early, early mid-1990s the meaning of public opinion in the present, he said, the silhouette of a phantom, the haunting fear of democratic consciousness. One way of understanding Pareno's project at this moment would be to see it as a search for dispositif, for, for technologies that could make a spectral public visible without simply dissolving its internal differentiations. Derrida put it this way, as opposed to a unilateral relation between communication technologies and public, the possibility of multilateral relations of what he called a right to a right of response, a, a right that allows the citizen to be more than the fraction of a passive consumer public necessarily cheated because of this. The technology of response Perino proposed in the mid-1990s was simple enough. A demonstration tool, as he called it, consisting of helium-filled white balloons in the shape of cartoon speech bubbles, purposefully left blank so that the bearer could inscribe his or her own demands onto them, conceived in 1996 and first realized the following year. He was almost certainly inspired by a moment he witnessed during a massive Paris march of early 1994 in defense of public education. Amidst the densely assembled protesters with their banners and placards, he saw two hands holding a crude handmade sign on a sheet of white paper that read, love, right, amour. The potency of this simple gesture would seem two years later to have motivated the conception of speech bubbles. Simultaneously, I mean, I'm an art historian, so I can't leave it at that, obviously, right? Simultaneously, the double genealogy of this work within opposing camps of the neo-avant-garde is apparent. On one hand, the technology of multilateral response was already prefigured in situationist circles of the later 1960s in the strategy of detournement, and more specifically in René Viennet's insistence that defacing advertising posters and the like with graffiti would, um, as he writes, bring to the surface the subversive speech bubbles that are spontaneously but more or less consciously formed and dissolved in the imagination. And here you see a slightly more polished version of this notion of detournement. This is a, uh, an advertising image uh, for Guy Debord's uh, book, which had just been released uh, in the fall of 67, The Society of the Spectacle. And they're taking a, uh, you know, a daily comic strip character and uh, in, you know, instead of, it's like Steve Canyon or some shit, right? Instead of him saying like, you know, I love you, I don't love you, or like, you know, why won't you marry me or something? Uh, they have this beautiful, you know, um, you know, Debordian Hegelian mar Marxist um, quote about, uh, you know, the non relation between rev project of revolution and non-life. I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but anyway, you get the you get the idea, right? To to kind of substitute. Uh, 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 you know, to, to subvert these mass cultural images by substituting subversive or, or revolutionary captions on them. So it's like, I think, one, one genealogy for Perino's project, but not the only one. On the other hand, Speech Bubbles owes its formal specificity to the example of Andy Warhol's Silver Clouds of 1966. Those metalized plastic film pillows uh, filled with a mixture of helium and oxygen so they would float lazily through the gallery on latent air currents. Two remarks might be apposite here. Uh, first, that the reflective silver surfaces of Warhol's pillows worked to dissolve their form in an inexact, unstable gleam, their, their determinate shape giving way to accidental, distorted patterns of light and dark reflected from the space of the room in which they were exhibited. And second, that precisely to the extent that silver clouds took up and extended the paradigm of the monochrome, first explored in Warhol's silk screens, they were premised on a radical refusal or negation of the communicative potential of the artwork. In speech bubbles, Pereno effectively inverts the Warholian strategy. 
so that the balloons no longer reflect their ambient environment, but now reflect the demands of their bearers, overlaying the monochrome surface with text and thereby making it speak. Once again, however, speech bubbles demand to be contextualized within a broader framework than can be provided by the aesthetic or even the politico-aesthetic terrain alone. Getting to know more about French protest in the mid-1990s than you really plan to on a Saturday afternoon at the Bronze. Eh, that's all right. The date of the work's conception, 1996, marks it as a product of the aftermath of the largest wave of labor strikes and mass protest in France since the events of May 68. The pursuit of an aggressive neoliberal agenda on the part of the French government, along with proposed social security reforms, had triggered a mass popular revolt in the winter of 1995 that showed few signs of quickly abating. Now, I think what's important about these strikes, what's notable here is that they were driven by rank and file union members and non-unionized workers rather than by the trade union leadership. The initial move for these strikes was opposed by the official trade unions. It was really a movement from below, uh, uh, impelled by the base, and as such, deeply ambivalent toward the politics of representation embedded in the hierarchical trade union movement. Perino has long described speech bubbles as a demonstration tool specifically designed for use by the communist-dominated CGT, right, the Confédération Générale du Travail, and legend has them being utilized in a 1997 demonstration um, by this union, right, although um, oddly never documented, so, okay, we'll see. In any case, whether that's, a, whether that's true or not, the piece was clearly conceived in the same post-1995 atmosphere of labor militancy that had seen the critique of union representation and the embrace of spontaneity. Or as Perino said a few years afterward, they were a modest tool for demonstrating that enables everyone to write their own slogans and to stand out from the group, and thus from the image that comes to represent it. His language here is significant and clarifies the fundamental political stake of the project. The intent is to differentiate the individual from the group and from the image of the group, from, in other words, one's subsumption to a coercive representation. Jacques Rancière may again help us to understand the import of Perrano's statements here. Leftist thought has typically understood political action as predicated on the passage from disorganized series to fused group, you know, from uh, uh, disorganized, you know, urban, uh, the, the, you know, the, the bado, the crowd of bado or the crowd on the street to um, uh, this notion of um, a group uh, drawn together as uh, uh, in a form of fusion. Uh, here, you know, the language is uh, famously that developed by Jean-Paul Sartre in his famous account of the storming of the Bastille a group that's for itself, right? Yet, this is precisely the dynamic Ranciere questions that move from series to fused group. When crowds form in Ranciere's work, it's generally not, as with Sartre, in order to storm the Bastille. They come together, rather, to stage the process of their own disaggregation. He thereby traces the paradoxical outline of the demos as a simultaneous coming together and breaking apart. I mean, the people is nothing other than the invention of new and hitherto unauthorized modes of disaggregation, disagreement, and disorder. To the extent that trade unions like the CGT wished to keep members in their proper places, speech bubbles provided a space where such representations could be resisted. A simple dispositif that nevertheless allowed for a multilateral response against the unison demanded by the demonstration as image. I mean, a, a resistance, in a sense, to uh, um, the crowd as a monolithic entity. Of course, yes, that's something of a utopian horizon for these works. Um, if indeed they were utilized as an actual demonstration tool in 1997, since that time, speech bubbles hasn't been found covered in slogans and carried in protests, but mute floating in large bunches under the ceiling of exhibition spaces. In 
In that sense, they remain closer to Warhol's silver clouds than the situationist's subversive detournement. Whether one reads this as due to the limits of labor militancy in the later 1990s or those of Perino's project itself depends on one's point of view. And in any case, we should most likely hold both to account. The failure of speech bubbles, which is at once the failure of an entire moment in counter-hegemonic struggle, is perhaps codified within the body of Perino's work itself. For how else are we meant to read the blank marquees he has been producing since 2006 than as dialectical reversals of the earlier balloons? What had, would ha what had, been, what had been a surface of potential inscription becomes an inaccessible space of a unilateral communication that chooses to remain silent or at best speaks an unknown tongue. The disaggregated subject of protest becomes the collective subject of spectacle. The speech bubbles were always intended for the street. Even when they are confined within the exhibition space, their helium-filled buoyancy threatens to lift them out the nearest window. They, they practically yearn for what lies outside the museal institution. The marquees, like their cinematic real-world counterparts, can only signal an opposite movement, luring visitors into the gallery as a crowd of monads united in their very separation. In the words of one of the great motion picture theater designers of the 20th century, we've attempted to stimulate the escape psychology in the design of our theater fronts to throw off the cares of the day and dwell for a while in the land of make-believe. That, I think, is a succinct summary of the dynamic in the Marquise. But we would also, let's say um, as an aside, then have to take into account his latest revision of this form, the speech bubbles becoming the hovering fish of his last New York exhibition and seen most recently uh, floating in the turbine hall at Tate in London as part of his um, Hyundai commission. Here, we are again confronted with a muteness, but now coupled with a strange impression of non-human sentience as these organic, inorganic objects seem to move about with indiscernible purpose, almost as analogies of the exhibition audience itself. Perhaps then we might conclude with one final work, the artist's 2015 film, The Crowd, first screened as one component of his exhibition at the Park Avenue Armory in New York, which opened early in the summer of that same year. It pictures a rather large crowd, the artist used around 300 extras, in the space of the exhibition itself, the armory's vast uh, drill hall. In effect, it establishes a mise en abîme, ima uh, imagining and staging a group of people visiting a future exhibition, namely the one in which the crowd itself was to be projected. But that pat description hardly captures the uncanniness of the film in which we first see the actors from above as they relax, uh, lounging on the hall's floor, reading, texting, or simply reclining with their eyes shut. As daylight fades and the space darkens, they arise and mill around, at one point standing transfixed by some off-screen spectacle. We'll later be treated to the images of fiery conflagration that caught their attention. And then forming, as you see here, a, a semicircle around a spotlit void listening to an unseen musical performance at whose conclusion the crowd applauds. Daylight returns to the hall and the actors exit, speaking casually with one another as if a spell had been broken. Throughout, the individuals making up this crowd seem automaton-like, devoid of will. And in fact, Perino made use of a professional hypnotist to place his actors in a suggestive state. What they enact, however, is not simply the viewing of the exhibition, but something closer to a typology of the contemporary urban crowd. In the yawning, empty space of the hall, we seem to witness successively the dispersed leisure of lunchtime or weekend visitors to a park, the distracted wandering of window shoppers and at the mall, the more manic rush of commuters in a train or subway station, the entranced gaze of moviegoers at the theater, or the gathering of onlookers and listening to a street performance. 
in its recourse to hypnotic states, the crowd in fact returns us to the very origin of the pseudoscience of crowd psychology, which we might understand to be the obverse of the Flaneur's bemused typology of the spectacle of urban life, the kind of dark side of the Flaneur's classifications. As it emerged in the late 19th century, crowd psychology relied crucially upon theories of hypnotism in order uh, to articulate the mechanism of imitation that it understood to be the defining characteristic, characteristic of large groups, in which the individual seemed to lose his or her conscious will and surrender to a form of reciprocal suggestion. Drawing upon contemporary schools of hypnotic research, theorists like Le Bon or Taub attempted to account for what they saw as the barbarous nature of crowd behavior. And in hypnosis, they found an exploration for the forms of collective hallucination and the predominance of the unconscious that, in their eyes, characterized the masses. In the crowd, the people are similarly reduced to a set of punctual reflexes, shuffled from scene to scene, an undifferentiated mass whose component parts nevertheless remain isolated from one another. We're familiar with this crowd. It's very much like that of spectators in a cinema, the ones conjured by its irrational influence in Siegfried Krakauer's From Caligari to Hitler, the ones subject to its control and domestication in Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno's culture industry. But another possibility exists. Beyond the sociological quantity named audience, lies the potentiality of the demos, the, the phantom public. Not long after the premiere of the crowd, Pareno explained, I, I don't like the word audience. I don't think that as an artist you relate to an audience, he says. It's not my problem. The public, though, is another matter. There is a dialectical difference. The, the public is on the side of the other, while the audience is on the side of the spectacle. To be on the side of the other is to recognize that that collectivity, uh, I'm sorry, let me try that again. To be on the side of the other is to recognize that collectivity is not the surrender of singularity into an undifferentiated mass, but the staging of a disaggregation. Pereno's work, as it's taken shape over the last 25 years, is at least in part an engagement with the various forms through which collectivity has found expression in a period when the very possibility of such communal identification has come under sustained attack. This necessarily entails, on our part, a recognition of the work's openness to social forces that lay outside the confines of the autonomous artwork. So while he may well be an inheritor of Duchamp and a proponent of a relational aesthetics, we need to understand these as ciphers of some larger dynamic, engaging the question of the crowd form in the present. The point, needless to say, is not to force Perino's work to occupy a particular political position of one kind or another, but to see the manifold ways in which it's given provisional form to a phantom public in those intervals between the demos' presence and its absence. Far from the flaneur who gives expression to the crowd, it is here a matter of the multitude itself shaping the artwork under its own impulsion. Thank you. Thank you. Tom at one point mentioned um, edge spaces and um, the French Bamou. And I just want to let everybody know or remind everybody that we have a, an exhibition coming up um, that starts in at the end of June called Mohamed Bouissa, Urban Riders, who deals very much with um, that theme. Thank you for that talk. Um, our last speaker today is Man Bartlett, whose work you saw when you came in on the ceiling of, of the light court. Um, so he is one of the artists in our exhibition. Um, do you want me to, to read? Where are you? Do you want me to read the year that you were born? <laughs> it's, it says it here. Man Bartlett is a multidisciplinary artist who lives and works in New York. His diverse practice includes sound, drawing, collage, video, performance, and digital projects that often use online platforms as outlets for playful yet subversive social critique 
and he's going to talk today about um, his project upstairs and hopefully about some of the other things that he's been, he's been very involved um, in lots of different aspects of this exhibition. Jan Bartlett. If you could uh, indulge me in a moment, and if we could all stand up. It's been a long day. Blood maybe needs to flow a little bit. So if you could just move your body just a little bit, just like shake it out, maybe move your legs, your feet probably need to move. And like if you can, just like stretch all the way up. Yeah, all the way up. Ah, let that out. Let's do a big in breath and then out breath. Ah, and then shake that out. And then move one seat. So I don't care where you move, just move to a seat that you hadn't been sitting in before you just got up. The reason for that is the seat that you have been sitting in is probably a little warm. And now you'll have a nice, new, fresh, cold seat. So the, the idea in sort of starting over here is to play with the, the notion of, um, of audience and spectacle and uh, this idea of gawking, which I think was really interesting to hear Bridget talk about. And this unpredictability, um, which I have to tell you, uh, I have some slides that I'm going to show. I'm going to talk about some of my work and some of the work that I think um, I've seen online and in uh, person for the last couple of years. Um, but beyond that, I don't really know what's going to happen. right? So I'm trying to keep this as open and flexible as possible. So we'll see how that goes. We, we ready for that? Got a little blood flowing a little bit? OK. First, uh, thank you to the Barnes, to Tom, and to Martha um, for inviting me to, to uh, come to this space. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, so it's a, a very particular honor to be able to uh, be here right now. It's kind of 100% um, surreal, actually. So um, unbelievably grateful for this opportunity. So radical listening. Um, with me. Um, quick, name is man, it comes from a manual, it's a nickname. So in case you're wondering, um, I wear that sort of as um, a reminder that I need to be a better representation of my gender. And so it keeps me uh, as honest as possible. Um, and I'd like to start with this sort of amazing um, and ridiculous um, quote from The Independent, that analysts at Bank of America have reportedly suggested that there is a 20 to 50% chance our world is a matrix-style virtual reality, and everything we experience is just a simulation. So that probability is probably less. If you're Elon Musk, you say it's one in a billion, right? That, that, and what this means is, is that, has people seen The Matrix, by the way? I know it's been like a long time. Yeah? Show of hands. Seen The Matrix? No? OK. So, so basically the idea that we live in a simulation, that this reality, and, the, and this, the philosophy goes back many, many years, um, not just The Matrix. But I think, um, and smarter people than me know the, the full history of that. I'm not an academic, so um, take that as you will. Um, but I think there's something to this notion that how we experience, um, how we experience either the reality or the simulation of reality. And I think about this when I'm uh, listening to lectures or when I'm on the subway, and it informs a lot of my relationship to uh, the things that I create and the things that I look at. My history in coming to this stage is a sort of a very long roundabout path. Um, I actually started in the theater. Uh, my degree is uh, from Emerson College in Boston. And at some point during my uh, college studies, I came across Ubu Ra, um, Alfred Jerry's 1896 play. And what I won't go into the, the details, but what struck me most about this is that it was a production that, that started in a riot and that the entire audience rioted. Um, and the opening word of the play is a bastardization of the word shit. And so that sort of like um, boldness or kind of like the absurdity of that action was just really enthralling to like, you know, 19-year-old man who was like, yeah, let's like make some crazy shit. Um, and it stuck with me um, to the point where even though there is not much of a uh, correlation, and I think a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today there's not a lot of correlation um, directly to even the idea of a flanor or a cyber flanor, but I think that there's a relationship between space, people in space, and, and either the audience perspective or the individual viewer's perspective. And so as you'll see, the sort of stream of consciousness that plays throughout here 
um, each of these works are kind of touching them in different capacities. Um, so the work you're seeing on the right here is Wafal Bilal's 2007 uh, Domestic Tension. Um, the original name for this piece was Shoot an Iraqi. And I happened to be living in Chicago at the time. And um, I actually had just gotten my first gallery show with the gallery where this was being presented. So I was there at the, uh, the opening sort of reception. And basically the piece, he's a, an Iraqi uh, American citizen. And it was to recreate the feeling that his brother had um, living in Iraq during the war, um, unable to leave his house. And so he rigged a paintball uh, machine to shoot that the internet could control. So you could go online, go to a website, and control this paintball gun and choose to shoot him or not. And there have been very few experiences in my, uh, in my artistic life where I've had the chance, A, to witness something like that in person, but to be exposed to something that was so visceral, so conceptual, yet performative, and also just completely insane. Um, from a perspective of giving the audience control um, over uh, a paintball. And it wasn't, it's, you know, paintball, if you get hit by it, it hurts a lot. It's not just like, oh. It's like, no, it really hurts. Um, and Wafal documented this uh, performance over the course of the month of the exhibition. And so you sort of saw him progress. And he stayed in the gallery 24 hours, um, seven days a week. And, and he subsisted just off of the things that people would uh, bring to the gallery, so just uh, food that was brought to him. And so I think about this idea of the audience, and I think about the people that, and so one of the amazing things that happened during this is that um, these groups of people started um, coming together to, to make sure the gun was pointed away from him. And so the crowd was actually controlling the gun and making sure, they had a name like Angels or something, um, to keep it away. And I think that's an amazing sort of um, outcome of something that could have gone a much different way. So I moved to New York in uh, 2008 uh, to work at a startup. I was promptly laid off. Uh, so I was like, oh, great, what am I going to do? So I left New York, traveled for um, almost a year. And when I got back, um, I was trying to figure out like, what, what shape uh, my practice would take. And in the intervening years between theater and getting to New York, I had started making visual work, really terrible paintings, which is why you're not seeing any of them here today. Um, really bad. Um, but I started thinking about what, uh, how performance could um, expand into social media. And so I did this piece called 24 Hour Best Non-Buy, where I spent 24 hours in a Best Buy shopping but not buying anything. And so what that entailed was me literally going up to every single product in the store and having a personal relationship to that product to say, it, to do a little internal checklist. Do I need this? Do I want this? And then ultimate, ultimately concluding that I was not going to buy it. So it sort of became my mantra. And the project actually was an outgrowth of an experience that I had where um, I was uh, desperately broke and needed to borrow money from a friend uh, to buy a computer that had been stolen. And after I bought the computer, I realized that I couldn't afford to keep the computer. I needed to pay my rent uh, at the place where I lived. And so in order to return this computer, um, it took me something like two hours waiting in line. And then they were trying to do all these, like, they weren't going to give all the money back. And it was this unbelievably humbling and demoralizing um, experience. But also when I realized that this particular Best Buy in New York is open 24 hours, which is kind of um, insane. Because you might need a cable at 4 in the morning or a new television. Um, so all right. How are we doing, by the way? Feeling good? If you need to stand again, just like stand. It's cool. I leave that up to you now. Um, so th this is a piece by uh, Jonah Bruckner Cohen. And it's actually, I kind of love this. The GIF is not supposed to look like this at all. But in the translation from the Macintosh to the uh, Windows computer, it has this kind of amazing effect going on. Um, but basically, the piece is a drill that was installed. Um, and it's been uh, installed a couple different places over the years. But um, where a, uh, a hit to a website correlates to an actual hit of this drill into the building. And again, this relationship between an audience taking an action and something happening in real world. And that's something that I'm deeply fascinated in because of how we communicate today. Um, and this is another project that's really grown on me over the years um, from John Rathman. And basically, um, John just scoured Google uh, uh, street View, and looked for interesting scenes uh, all, over, all over the world. And so I'll just sort of scroll through some of these. Um, and they really tell a story. I mean, in some sense, these are just found objects. 
And I remember very distinctly thinking at the time that um, where, where does, where, what is the genesis for a work of art? And this is maybe a deeper philosophical question, but when you take something um, and it's essentially a copy, um, where does it exist outside of just the action of looking, right? And over the years, I've come to sort of, I keep returning to this piece because I keep thinking about how it's essentially just a snap, snapshot, but through Google um, and through a sort of uh, technology which has come to rule uh, much of our lives, whether we realize it or not. And these are some just bizarre and sometimes devastating scenes. And there's little or no context ever given to um, what was happening. Um, they're not explained. And from what I could see online, uh, the artist didn't even provide a very clear synopsis of, other than to just have a website. And he's talked about this project, and this project has been talked a lot about. Um, so I started doing these 24-hour performances. Um, partly as an outgrowth of that experience in, in uh, Best Buy, but also as a way to kind of um, expand my relationship to time. And living in New York, which is a very like uh, intense place, like all the time, you're always kind of like super stressed and like you're not sure if anything's ever gonna work. Um, it gave me an ability to kind of, um, yeah, to expand time and to kind of decontextualize time. So while it's a very rigid structure, uh, performance in 24 hours, it has a very specific beginning and end time. Um, what happens in between that gets elongated into this very surreal kind of um, durational uh, experience. And for this particular piece, which is a commission from uh, Creative Time, I went to uh, the most amazing place in New York, uh, Port Authority, and um, spent 24 hours there talking to people. And I talked to them uh, in line when they were going somewhere. So they were traveling to meet their family. And I talked to them online about where they had been. And sort of the idea was to see if I could match those two audiences and make any kind of connections um, between people who I was meeting in person and people who I was talking to online. Um, and interestingly, it was, it was uh, the, the construct was uh, the performance was a failure. I'll put that as bluntly as possible. And that I found that in order to stay engaged, um, I either had to be in one place or the other, right? So I either had to be here, like, okay, we'll have a conversation, like, how's it going? How are you feeling? Yeah, good. Doing good. Do I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah, it's like, it's going all right. I think you still have the attention, so I feel okay. Or, thank you. <laughs> Not yours? Got mine. Got mine, okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I'll try to keep it. Or I had to be completely separated from that and mediating the experience through trying to communicate to people online. And so when I'm talking like, oh, I'm giving a talk right now. So this, this disconnect, it's a cognitive disconnection, but it's also a very, um, you're accessing a different part of your brain. And so these performances, these 24-hour performances, were trying to kind of meld those two or um, kind of see if I could exist in two places at once. Um, and I, I, I couldn't. Maybe other people can. I think uh, there have been some amazing people continuing work in this sort of um, particular area who have done it better than I. But I just know I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, so part of the outgrowth of um, those performances of which I did uh, quite a few was I started thinking about other durational performances. And this was right around the time that Occupy Wall Street um, and I had been in London doing a project, um, and I came back right as it was sort of ramping up. And I started thinking a lot about the um, individual's relationship to the gallery system and to, um, to money um, specifically, and how we earn a living as artists, and where the kind of smoke and mirrors are. And I was talking to a lot of artists who were saying, you know, well, um, I get money from this place, or I get money from here, or I uh, have a trust fund, or I get this particular collector and this particular donor. Um, and it's a very touchy subject. You gotta be careful when you talk about this stuff. And I actually had one uh, artist friend of mine say, you know, you really can't talk about that. Like, I wanna tell you privately that this is a cool project, um, but you will end up on blacklist for this. Um, so it's, 
basically, I spent a year documenting my finances and um, put them publicly in the form of a Twitter account and then uh, as a Google document where anyone could see. And if you can look at some of these, let's, let's get the laser pointer out. Um, kombucha, tea, ice cream, um, protest sandwiches, photocopies, McDonald's and Starbucks. I had a terrible diet. Um, and people would comment on that. And people would reply to this account and say, you need to eat better. Um, <laughs> which is not wrong, but I was a little bit like, come on, like, <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. Um, and I started this project with something like $70 to my name, and I ended this project with something like $70 to my name. And the entire thing um, was documented for a full year. Um, and it really was awkward. I had, um, particularly when there were art sales. So I wouldn't say who the collector was, but I would say the amount. Um, I wouldn't say what the work was, but the amount that, I would, that, was, that, were, that was income was in there. So this sort of radical transparency um, is something that I, that I kind of play with and then go a little bit back away and then come up uh, and kind of look at again. Um, so yeah. So this is a really um, interesting project uh, by Heather Dewey Hagborg. And um, basically, she went into different uh, areas in New York and found pieces of chewing gum, cigarette butts, um, hair extracted the DNA from them, and then made portraits um, loosely based off of that uh, particular DNA's information. Um, and I think about this particularly in relationship to kind of what we've been talking about today, right? Where you had people going out into the streets, uh, strolling, looking at what's happening, gawking, and then building stories based around that. So I think if we go back to the, this morning, and the, the Andre showed that image of the, the train, uh, the bridge, and it was really, uh, it, you got, the, you got a sense that you were there seeing the story, right? And I think what's interesting to me about this is that you, know, you see a piece of gum. And if you pass a piece of gum on the street, you might be able to invent some story about it. But technology is getting to the point where you can actually make an approximation of what someone might actually look like. Um, and that's both terrifying, um, but from a conceptual standpoint, really interesting. Um, and what are the implications of that, of how we um, exist in public and how we exist um, in space. So I was, I was going to show the Vito Conchi piece. I was really close to including it, and I was like, nah, you know, like, we know that one. Uh, and it was going to be a setup for this one, um, which is Lauren McCarthy's follower. And uh, I just, I really love this quote from the video. Uh, well, first I'll give you the, the brief introduction of the project, which is uh, a service that, um, that grants you a real life follower for a day, a no hassle, unseen companion, someone that watches, someone that sees you, someone who cares. And this notion that you, know, you, could, you could order someone to follow you around all day uh, with the equivalent being of a social media follower but in real life. And you don't know that that person's there and then the result is that they, they take one photograph of you and that's sort of the product that you get out of this. And I don't want another relationship. I just want to have a relationship with somebody that I never have to talk to. They can just follow me and see me having a relationship with myself. Which, like, I, I don't know how many people you ha OK, uh, another poll of the audience here. Who has a Facebook account? OK, does anyone not have a Facebook account, just out of curiosity? Cool. Oh, wow, that's a great, that's a good number. So for those of you that do have a Facebook account, if you use it with any regularity, you understand how the system is, is completely rigged against you to exploit you, and um, I won't go down that rabbit hole, but um, I would assume that you have some awareness and understanding of what it feels like when someone either friends you or follows you uh, or likes something that you posted. Um, and so this project brilliantly kind of took that idea into physical space. Okay. I don't think I have anything else on that one. So, um, this is a recent work um, called Browsing the Blues. And it's part of a ongoing investigation into the audio space, right? And it's taken a couple different forms. I did a project that didn't really make sense to include here a couple of years ago, where um, I created a 24-hour audio collage that um, uh, mimicked uh, times of day. And so I've been thinking a lot about audio and, and what our relationship uh, is to it. And so this piece took, um, I had an iPhone that I had uh, electromagnetic microphones that I hooked up to the iPhone. Um, and I was able to record the electromagnetic output of my phone while I was browsing my social media feed. 
So the idea is that you're making um, audible the device that you use um, to do, well, at least the device that I use uh, way more than I should to kind of connect to the world. Um, and the results, uh, which we can listen to, So you're hearing two things. Uh, one is actually a, a drone generator that I have, and the other uh, coming up, the staticky stuff coming up, that will be the electromagnetic. And so the sounds are me scrolling, me opening an app, liking something. So you get the idea, 20, 27 minutes of this. Um, but having that kind of uh, audible relationship to what the actions are helps me understand um, in a different way. It gives me another in, um, input into what, the, oh, I didn't fade it out. So there you go, that was it. Um, and actually, I was in that show, uh, Angie was in that show by uh, total coincidence. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was the that was the uh, the show at Ar Arabite. Oh. Um, so, internet noise is not an art project, at least not um, explained as such. Um, but it's a project that um, Dan Schultz started uh, very recently, um, and it's to basically create um, noise on your browsing history. And the purpose is that all this information is being collected um, about you when you uh, do anything online. And, um, and, and this sort of the idea uh, is to obfuscate your browsing by throwing out um, browser tabs with a bunch of sort of uh, misleading information. So two of the ones that I got from a recent um, experiment with this was uh, disengagement pneumonia raincoat, which is kind of awesome, and playing the Alphorn. Um, and so I think a lot about what, you know, when you're looking at something online, when you're, tr when you're browsing, when you're Googling um, information, this is, these are, in some sense, physical destinations that you're traveling to. And the situation is such right now um, that lots of very powerful interests are watching you every step along the way. Um, and effectively, this is like a very clear um, a correlation with following. <laughs> um, and I think that the question then becomes, what do we do with that? And that's not something that I am, have any authority to, to speak about. Um, I have very personally mixed uh, feelings about what it means to be tracked today and what it means to, um, to have that information accessible. Um, I think that privacy is an important thing that we just have awareness of what's being collected from us, and then we can make decisions accordingly, not to get overly didactic about it. Um, okay. So I have two things that I'm gonna show now, and then I promise I'm gonna talk about my Barnes thing. I promise, coming soon. I'm saving it for the end, so. Um, but these two things to me are kind of, they're interrelated. One is the million dollar, uh, million dollar homepage uh, from 2005, um, where uh, this person basically just uh, sold real estate uh, on a website in order to help uh, fund his college uh, tuition by selling a pixel for a dollar. And there are a million pixels, so it's a million dollars. It's a brilliant project. Um, and it, it, again, not really an art project, more like a social experiment. And uh, recently, um, actually just a couple weeks ago, read it as an April Fool's um, Day sort of hijinks. They did something sort of similar called Place. And what you're seeing here is a time lapse of 72 hours um, where any Reddit user could add a single pixer, pixel once every five minutes to the canvas. So there's a, you should, it's, this story of how this kind of came to be is worth reading if you haven't uh, looked into it. It's fascinating what happened over the course of the 72 hours. You can see that sort of black, um, the little black, oh wait, hold on. I went too soon. We're going to watch it again because it's a cool thing. Um, oh wait, I gotta go back twice. Let's see here. There we go. 
They make the, the laser green and the forward green, which is a little confusing. Um, but you can see the sort of black area that started taking over the piece at a certain point um, by users who were intent on destroying this sort of community. Um, but ultimately, they didn't win. Yay, for once, like the trolls didn't win. And it did turn into like a little Pink Floyd thing, which is kind of funny. Um, as a work of art, I mean, this is like, maybe as low brow as you could possibly go. You've got the Mona Lisa, got OSU, and like all types of um, pretty like tacky things going on. But as a communal experiment, it's actually really fascinating what um, developed over that, that 72 hours. Um, OK, uh, last but not least um, is my project here. Um, so has everyone gotten a chance to sort of see in the lobby? Yes, maybe. Um, if you haven't, it's in the lobby upstairs. Um, and the project is called We See, We Hear, We Are. And um, it was developed over the course of uh, many months in uh, collaboration with Shelley Bernstein, who's here. Who, Shelley, if you're watching, thank you. Um, also, hi to the live stream viewers. Um, but it was uh, an outgrowth of a conversation in this relationship between uh, physical space and the idea of being a flaneur and digital space and, and being online and what it means to exist online today. And the sort of specific uh, entry point begins with um, the we see component, which is uh, you're seeing a still from a website which uh, is connected to uh, Instagram's API. So anytime someone posts with the hashtag person of the crowd, this uh, AI uh, attempts to interpret the image that has been posted. Right, so person standing in front of a television. So the, the application went to the Instagram uh, feed, to the hashtag, and looked at it and thought that it saw a person standing in front of a television. Then it puts that into language and it reads it out loud. So if you go into the lobby, you can hear it, um, the sort of computerized voice speaking on a continual basis, all the images that are posted, uh, person of the crowd, to Instagram. And if you uh, do it, you can see, I will say it's a little, uh, you don't know when the uh, image is going to be uh, incorporated into the piece, so it, it will be there, but you might wait a little while. Um, and that's part of the idea of kind of separating from a typical um, experience of the hashtag for an exhibition, where as part of a, a marketing component, you, you have this hashtag and you build a campaign around it. And I wanted to take that idea um, of how we engage with social media and into the context of an actual uh, work of art. And so in my mind, it kind of balances on those two between a, a way of showing how people are interpreting the person in the crowd exhibition, um, as well as how this technology is influencing our relationship to um, social media and our experience of the world in which we live. Um, the next component of the piece is called We Hear. Um, and for that, I worked with the education department here at the Barnes um, with two different groups of high school students. And we went to 30th Street Station um, and I, I picked that location because we had, uh, I had heard uh, that the Solari board, which is that fl flip top display that makes all the noise, uh, is going to be taken down there. Um, and I have such a nostalgic memory of, uh, and experiences of being in 30th Street um, and hearing that sort of reverberation of the space, and particularly with that actual display, which marks the passage of time and um, trains coming and going. Um, and it just sounds really cool. And so we went to this location uh, partly for that, but also because it is this kind of transportation hub where people are coming and going. And so what I did is I had the students um, turn, put their planes, their, <laughs> their planes, put their phones in airplane mode. Uh, and for 11 minutes, we just sat there in 30th Street and just listened. And the experience was really, students were, hearing things that they, they were, their relationship to what they were hearing uh, became so amplified. Because if you get really quiet, you start to hear things. And so I had them write down what uh, they heard. And then they uh, spoke to each other, and they filmed it. And so the, the We Hear component in the exhibition, as it's installed, is a video of their describing what they heard. And so if you juxtapose that with what a computer is sort of thinking it's seeing, you have this kind of very subtle relationship between, not subtle at all actually, but you have this relationship between uh, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And is there any overlap between the two? Where do we get it right? Where, do, where does it get it wrong? And vice versa. And the, um, the last component, excuse me one second. It's 
called We Are, um, which is currently being represented by a Google um, Street View image from right outside here. And this is, uh, consists of the, the website for the exhibition. So it has various information, um, sort of, again, the, the more marketing information, where to buy tickets, um, what is happening and when. And it also has sort of an introduction into this project. But throughout the course of the exhibition, I've been adding materials to it, taking materials away, and kind of working it a little bit like, um, like a, a website as a sculpture, as a sort of a block of clay. And the idea is that we'll continue to kind of evolve and expand throughout the performances that will be happening over the next month. And so um, I'll be documenting those performances and then incorporating my documentation into this website. Um, and this, I should also say that I worked with some uh, really just amazing people here at the Barnes um, to put this together. And I also worked with uh, web developer Brian Feeney, who is like instrumental in getting the website up, um, and a code artist, Kyle McDonald, who um, developed the code for the AI, and also all the students. This couldn't have been done without them. So um, I think my next slide is uh, where it says end here. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys, so much. <laughs> oh, wait. You go up here now, right? OK. Yeah, under the. Tom, do you want one? Yeah. Thank you. Um, three super interesting talks. Um, one thing that one theme that I was sort of noticing coming out in um, in all three of them was the sort of tension between trying to maintain agency when you're part of a crowd and this kind of inevitability of the giving over of the self, um, you know, losing your, yourself to the crowd that both Tom and, and Bridget talked about is sort of the kind of definition of the gawker. Um, and I, 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 I found it a little bit in your work too, when you were, when you were your own work, when you were talking about the um, the Best Buy project, because you were, I mean, it, it kind of comes back to this theme of resistance that we were talking about this morning. Like you were, you were resisting, you were, you were in the consumer landscape, but you were resisting being a consumer, you were refusing to give yourself over, and you were giving voice to it, you know, constantly with the tweets. So the, the tweets were sort of like the speech bubbles. Um, so I don't really have a question there. But I kind of want to, if anybody, I just sort of want to invite you to maybe say more about um, this idea mm -hmm. or just this tension. I mean, one of the, I can say something very general that yeah. just came to mind while you were talking about this problem of agency. One of the things I've been trying to think about in working on this topic is, um, which I think came out in my talk, that we have such incredibly negative associations with gawking and as a behavior, um, and it's something that when we do it, we find ourselves embarrassed by it. But I think that uh, I was really struck in looking at these, am I echoing? Does it sound weird? A little bit, but yeah. you need to <laughs> definitely speak up a little bit. I okay. Um, looking at these late 19th century artists who are engaging with this in their, in, in pictorial form in their works, that they certainly show some very cynical, um, very cynical interpretations of gawking behavior. It's, uh, there's a lot of that that's very you know, dark and alarming and disturbing, but there's, it's not all negative and that some of it is even quite positive. Some of it's very funny. Some of it's about you know, connection and empathy. Um, and so I think that thinking about this um, issue of agency um, and resistance or protest, that it doesn't always have to be a question of maintaining your agency in order to protest, that there's there can there's some radical potential too to letting your the integrity of your individuality dissolve at the boundaries, um, and that I mean that's part of the power of the crowd as a revolutionary force. 
um, at least in, definitely in the 19th century French mindset, and that there's um, something powerful about giving oneself over. It's just about who you're giving yourself over to. You don't want to give yourself over to the state. <laughs> but giving yourself over to each other, there can be power to that. I mean, that's just a general line of thinking I'm pursuing, um, in addition to the very necessary line of thinking from the beginning of crowd psychology forward of being um, you know, concerned and alarmed at what happens to subjectivity within a crowd situation. I mean, maybe I, I, I'm, like, I'm gonna ask for people's forgiveness for like probably expressing badly something that's too simple to have to say in the first place. But, um, you know, it seems to me like really significant to, in, in, in thinking about the question that you're posing, Martha, to remember that like all of the categories, all of the terms that we're dealing with here today are not um, like objective names for actual things, but are, you know, ideological and social constructions, you know? I mean, whether it's the crowd, the people, the flaneur, the badeau, I mean, that these are all terms that are invented for particular social functions at particular social moments. And it doesn't mean that they have a unified or singular meaning, of course, um, but that, you know, the fact is that many of the spaces where these terms were first developed uh, in popular literature like the physiologie are there to um, reassure a middle class audience about their control over a space that they didn't have an objective social control over yet. And um, I, I was noticing that uh, reading uh, Baudelaire um, a couple days ago and just reading Baudelaire, no, I mean, I was preparing <laughs> for this, <laughs> reading Baudelaire, <laughs> I mean, and it was like almost this, it was like there was a sense of urgency with which he was trying to insist that the flaneur has, he makes the meaning, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I, so I, I agree with you. Yes, I'm not sure where that's like, where I'm going to necessarily go with that, but simply um, to say that, you know, um, whether it's whether it's in the early 21st century or the, the later 19th, um, you know, we have to think about audience uh, as well. I mean, and, 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 you know, what kind of, I mean, beyond the, you know, abs I mean, it's absolutely necessary to recognize the internal complexity of these practices, objects, and the like, but that for, you know, they were um, shown in particular spaces and consumed in particular ways. So I can, I can sit here and, for example, talk about Speech Bubbles by Perino and say, you know, look at, look at this intricate, careful negotiation. But ultimately, when, you know, they're objects in a luxury marketplace, that sets some limits on how, on what kinds of claims I feel comfortable making. Mm -hmm. um, question for you, Bridget. And I'm sorry if you said this in your talk and I missed it. Um, I mean, we, we know that the flaneur is, is um, of a specific uh, class status. Is there also a class status assigned to the uh, no, Baudot? No. no, and one of the things that interests me most about it as a type, and I, I absolutely agree with Tom that these are, these are types, these are constructions that are um, you know, theorized in cultural criticism and literature and art um, that don't always map on to how this actually played out in the streets. But um, no, the Badeau was an equal opportunity type. I, anyone could be this Badeau. So um, they were, um, I, I went into the project thinking they were, there was always going to be this class differential of Flanner being affluent and Badeau being lower class, but that's actually not true. Badeau can be lower class, but they can also be very wealthy. They can be men, they can be women, they can be children, they can be um, tourists. They're often actually uh, theorized as tourists, so people from other nations, other nationalities, and also other ethnicities. So it's just very open um, model of looking that's, I think, interests artists um, well, and, can, and thinkers. Can I ask though, I mean, is the, is the nature of the Badeau essentially that it's not you? I mean, the Badeau is yeah. always someone else. Like, well, you know, someone else who's the kind of, you know, bit of a sucker, you know, interested in whatever, whatever passes by their view. And you, by your discerning nature of, you know, reading this 
book telling you about the Bado are already like, well, I, you well, know, like, I no, don't, I don't look at that but stuff. But no, like it's that. tourists it's and seeing other tourists yeah. and being like, but oh, it's actually, it's, it's yeah. actually not, no. not true. No, okay. Um, and there, uh, I mean, maybe the textual, uh, the kind of classic text that I cited and that several mm -hmm. of us pointed to, the uh, the Physiologie du Flaneur, mm -hmm. the um, the Victor Fornell that I cited, some of these early classic texts that talk about the Flaneur, where the Bado also appears, but that hasn't been discussed as much. There is often, you know, some of those statements are dripping with condescension, and even some of the um, the quotes I gave where the, the Bado is um, admired and praised, I'm still trying to figure out for myself how much irony there is there, mm -hmm. because I know that there are shades of irony to those statements of, you know, the, the Bado is actually an artist and worthy mm -hmm. of admiration. Mm -hmm. I think there's some irony there, but I'm still deciding how, on the scale of irony, how much, mm -hmm. <laughs> how much mm -hmm. irony. But in the works of art um, that really brought me to the project and that are the center of the project, what's striking is how much and how um, frequent, even almost a constant in um, the artists that engage with the Gawker as a type um, in the most interesting ways. The, they are always identifying with these figures mm. in pictorial ways mm. that are quite mm -hmm. clear, where they see themselves as artists, as Gawkers too, and they completely, mm. um, they might poke gentle fun at the Gawkers in the ways you're describing, but they also, through various means of you know perspectival positioning and others, analogize what they're doing to what the gawkers are doing mm -hmm. and also analogize what their viewers are doing looking at the work to what the gawkers are mm -hmm. doing. So I don't think that they um, have that, you know, it's not me okay. stance. Mm -hmm. um, before I, before I, I, I just want to ask one more question um, to, uh, to Man um, and just to kind of tie your, your talk a little bit to um, Angela's um, because you both talked about artificial intelligence versus human intelligence. And there was that moment in, in um, your talk where you, know, you showed what happens when we just, when the kind of human intervention goes away and it's just artificial intelligence and it kind of goes wrong. And um, th that happened in, in your project too, right? I mean, the, so, and I know you have ideas about the singularity. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> apocalyptic <laughs> ideas about artificial intelligence. How dark you guys want to go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, w I think it, it's not, I don't think anyone, we're, we're uh, it's such a, it's a black hole, right? I think on the one hand, um, I, I have deep concerns about um, the, uh, not concerns, but just sort of a, uh, a paranoia about the evolution of artificial intelligence with regards to corporations and our um, relationship to those corporations. So if the AI can only be developed by Google and Facebook at the scale at which it needs to evolve um, to, to actually have this sort of lasting impact of our lives, what is our relationship to then as like a normal everyday human? Um, and I think there is a scenario in which um, we lose sight, and I think that's why I started with that idea that we're in a simulation, and, and, and if we know it, does it change anything? Mm -hmm. And if we're not, does it matter at that point? So it's a thought experiment at that point. Um, but this idea that um, at some point the technology will become so advanced that we don't understand what's technology and what's not technology, and we lose our humanness in that. And I think if we're gonna have a hope as a, uh, as a species, it's that our consciousness will evolve in some capacity and will become embedded within other AIs, basically. Um, and you know, this is like, th there are people who have written really smart things about this, and, and I am not one of them. I'm just someone who's sort of looking at what other people are saying um, and trying to interpret it based off of how humanity tends to evolve. Um, and I think that we're further along than, we, than, we might, than many people might realize or at least that I realized as recently as like a year or two ago. Um, so I think, but the, uh, I do think there is a scenario in which um, we're able to evolve in ways that we can't actually predict right now. Um, I don't know what that will look like in one version of it though, it's not flesh and blood human sitting on a stage. Mm -hmm. And then to me that gets to the idea of like, what does it mean to be human at all, right? And this is like as old of a question as there is. Like, I exist on this planet, I, I think therefore I am, but 
so what? What, what, is, what is it that fundamentally makes us human? And I think that um, in the coming years, that will be um, much more evident. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, is it, uh, uh, is it working? There we okay. go. There we go. Yeah, okay. uh, listening to uh, the three of you, I, uh, it, it, was a, it was a daunting task to try to write down what, I, <laughs> what you were, uh, the points that you were making. But I, uh, I think I've tagged it to uh, that quote from Baudelaire that enjoying the crowd is an art. Because that runs through all three of your, 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 you know, your presentations, especially looking at man's long list of <laughs> artists, and then listening, and, th and then look, and then seeing um, the the, uh, the artwork that Bridget presents, which I have fallen in love with. <laughs> Great. <yeah. laughs> really, I'm going to have to really get into that. Tom is. It's di w it was difficult. And I don't think I'm alone. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm going to drink. I'm going to drink of water. <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. And I Let's think why it was just that it. I kept thinking. It was that Pereno. Yeah. Was 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 possibly, for me, uh, a, a, a tad too contemporary. But then that's the content, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Well, I'm not going to say that. But I just said, as far as I, I, you know, could bring myself, because you have you, oneself is 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 the focus for, or for, for you know, the, for for all of your work. I see myself as a badro. I mean, I, and, and we when when you sat down and we were talking and you asked, and I said, oh, it's like a, a like a butterfly that flies from South America to. To Canada, you got to stop at some point and I mean, smell the roses. I think we all tend to, when, wherever we are, be one or the other. Be that gawker or to be that flaneur that's you know going to a gallery or a um, a, a play, poetry reading. Mm. Where where do we, where do you see? Philadelphia in that context. I know where you see Philadelphia. First prize was two nights in Philadelphia. Uh, yeah, right. second, second prize, prize was, was a whole week in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. So, you know, but, uh, but man, I'm happy with man. And I'll, and I'll give this back because I know I, I tend to uh, blow the eight. I'm having my 50th Central High School reunion in three weeks. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, yeah, which is a major miracle. Yeah. yeah. But what it says, too, is that you reached out to Central students to be part of your... Yeah, well, the Barnes yeah. has a relationship with them, so they, they made that happen, and that wouldn't, I would never have been able to do that without the Barnes, so... So, again, so I, there I am and as a Philadelphian and as a fan of the Barnes. I am pulled into... You know, to this. That's why I, you know the question about where do you see Philadelphia mm -hmm. is is important to each each of you. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak to uh, as I spoke to you a little bit. I mean, I have a, this sort of not complicated but a bizarre nostalgia for this city. I grew up in in Ballackinwood in Belmont Hills, and would come into the city on the weekend sometimes. Um, I don't have a, but it's that that's in the past, right? So coming back to Philadelphia for this project, it was important to me that I kind of secretly looked at my own relationship to the city and the location um, in the location that I choose to work with the students. And so um, I don't know if I have a clear, and I, and I will say this from just a, a cosmetic perspective, Philadelphia has changed drastically um, in just a, a very short amount of time. And I think there's a part of me that, um, not that I don't like change, but that it worries, it worries me. Um, from a perspective of is, 
is the expansion sustainable? What will that look like? Is it going to um, go the same route as places like New York where you can't afford to live there anymore? And, and what does that rate of expansion look like? And, and who um, profits from that? And, and who gets um, put out because of that? Um, and so that is changing. I'm sure that that's changing the, the fabric of the city. But I, I say that as an outsider, someone who, who has come in and sort of is looking around as I walk from the train station to here, um, kind of what a general feeling is in the city. But at the same time, it, it feels kind of exciting. So I, I, you know, again, as an outsider, it's nice to see that. Um, so yeah, and I mean, I'm also equally excited to see what's been happening here at the Barnes. I think it's just, it's it, the fact that it exists in this space, and like, you know, I know I'm a bit of sounding like a Barnes groupie here, but like this building is like, it's amazing. It is a very, it's a phenomenal building, and the program. That, so the things that are happening here are really um, exciting and, and interesting to me from um, those perspectives. So. Oh yeah, the, uh, yeah. the youth. Uh, yeah, the, what was it called? The, detention the, center. The, the, yeah, the, the, oh, is that what was going to be on this location? Yeah. 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 That's a lot of change. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, okay. I'm not sure I followed well what was being talked about, but one of the things that sort of came to me. Um, when you were talking, Tom, yes. one of the things that came to me and then reflects back on other than the first talk was, let's see how I can explain this. Are you, were differentiations being made between a crowd with agency and a crowd without agency? In other words, mm -hmm. when you were showing, for example, all those um, protest groups, mm -hmm. including the against reality, which I really like, which I thought was really interesting. Um, was, were you showing that as a crowd of, a, I mean, yeah. I'm sure you were saying other things about it. No, sure. Showing that as a crowd with agency, and then the wonderful, I thought it looked wonderful, the artist whose name I don't, don't remember, but the one you talked about most of the time, mm -hmm. where the crowd, I guess it was in a gallery, I don't know what kind, sure. the figures were made out of. Sure, those are people. People. Yeah, okay, no, so that flesh and blood. Me like the <laughs> His greatest creation. The, the, the development yes. from the gawkers and the flunners to a crowd of non agency. Yeah, no, I, know, think that's, I think that's very David astute. Reisman, I think that's very astute. Crowd. Absolutely. Oh, wow, that's a, a good term to bring in, certainly, uh, and something that's been absent from, from the day. But, uh, you know, certainly in trying to think about. Um, maybe some of the things that separate 1850s from 1950s from you know, the, the, you know, our current moment is precisely uh, uh, new forms of collective alienation that, uh, that might be summarized in a term like Riesmann's uh, Lonely Crowd. I mean, a book that encompasses a wide range of, of things, of course. But no, I think, you're, I think the comment about agency is really, is really apt uh, and certainly, um, yeah, in the in the work that I'm discussing in Pereno's work, there's no single uh, there's no single through line about agency, and I, I and and I, you're right to detect uh, um, a, a variety of responses in his own work between uh, a, a, an attempt to maybe where it begins in a work like No More Reality is uh, providing agency to this you know group of uh, you know we would call it the youth. You know, <laughs> kids uh, uh, giving them over a kind of agency that they don't normally have in school to something like uh, in the speech bubbles, a simply a creation of a tool that people can use to, exp you know, to develop their own agency to this very strange final work, which I, you know, I, 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 I mean, I would have to admit if I'm being honest, I probably haven't entirely managed to wrap my head around uh, uh, in which, um, a cr uh, in which this assembly of people is um, transformed into some loose, strange, hypnotized agglomerate. I mean, it's almost as if you know uh, their their agent. You know, they begin with agency and then lose it, and then as they disperse, regain it. I mean, there's something very paradoxical about that. But I think those are those are interesting 
terms uh, uh, to bring in, and I suppose you know maybe 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 agency is a question that, while we haven't addressed explicitly, is something that's run through the entire um, the entire day, really, from you know from um, you know Andre at the very beginning to Man at the end. I think we've all been wrestling with that question, whether historically or in the present moment or, or both uh, um, in these talks. I think that makes a lot of sense. I kind of want to ask about, um, I want to ask you to analyze the Pepsi commercial, <laughs> the representation of the crowd. Oh, man. I, <laughs> I mean, maybe not everybody has seen it, so maybe that's I, I, not a good I, idea, yeah, but it's, like, it's I, so also, related like, to what we've been talking about like, today. I've, re I've read, ab I've oh, read about it. you haven't seen it? I'm just, I'm like an old man. I'm like, you know, reading Baudelaire. If we had more time, I would say, let's watch it right now and then talk about it as but, a group. But actually, could I, could I, actually, could I ask a question, though? Is that, or, or is that possible? Yes. Okay, because I really, actually, you know, I've been thinking a lot about Andre at the beginning and Bridget's talk, and I, I mean, I think the question begins by hearing your talk and knowing that part of the project for you is to bring this into questions about early cinema, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, that the Lumière uh, brothers enter yeah. into this. And, and and that got me thinking about, um, you know, Andre dealing with this imposition of a uniform time that also corresponds with um, a moment when photography is giving way to proto-cinematic technologies, and which are obviously themselves completely bound up with a, a standardization of time. And we couldn't have Moybridge and 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 and, and uh, uh, the like without you know, a very careful regulation of time. And then I'm curious about whether um, part of the transformation that we're, that you're both dealing with um, is, you know, and part of the move from like Flaneur to Badeau and the like um, has to do with an end point in cinema and whether that also means that partly what you're both dealing with is a move from, um, the individual reception of the aesthetic object to mode, modalities of collective reception. And I'm, so I'm wondering if both of you might kind of respond to, to that question a bit, that you know, it's no longer simply the crowd represented in the painting, but it's also the, the, the crowd as a new mode of reception of the artwork, you know, the, uh, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much, my main response to that is yeah. <laughs> you said it really well. <laughs> um, no, I think that I think that uh, it's not just cinema, but it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 1890s is so fascinating to me as a focal point for this topic, which certainly extends beyond the 1890s. And but I'm focusing there because, not just because of the birth of cinema, but also because of these other um, media that artists like Toulouse Lautrec and Bonnard and Balaton are working in these artists who see themselves primarily as painters who start mm -hmm. making posters and mm -hmm. um, yeah. prints that yeah. are just dis mass distributed in new kinds of print journalism mm -hmm. where they are working with a different mindset when they're creating their work knowing they will have a, a mass audience. Mm -hmm. um, and that there's, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of excitement and creative potential to that, but there's also a lot of anxiety about that, mm -hmm. um, about how to um, corral or attract and hold the attention of a mass audience. Um, and how, also how to compete. How does a painter still compete when there are posters and when there are, and when there are movies? And um, so mm -hmm. just that anticipating the collective audience I think is crucially important for this transition yeah. and the way that that's thematized in the pictures as well. But I do think that there's something about, I mean, it's, I'm sh it's, it's too neat and, and tidy, but there's definitely something about the, the beginning of cinema that really just kind of, um, codifies that as that this is the new regime, that mm -hmm. we, we watch things and we watch um, visual culture mm -hmm. in this collective kind of gawking way mm -hmm. um, that we didn't before. Although, you know, Daumier has, was showing gawkers in the salon True. decades sure. before. Mm -hmm. So there's, there is all kinds of continuity, but I do mm -hmm. think there's something to that. It's so bad. Uh, as this uh, discussion has been going on, I went back to the 1960s in my mind, and I was thinking of Marshall McLuhan. Mm -hmm. uh, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, I wonder how it could be like an overlay um, with all the different technologies, his perception of reality, 
um, of just giving it sort of like a different viewpoint or a different way of being able to look at everything that you've been talking about, it's just another dimension. Mm -hmm. Andre has a question too, but did you have another one? Uh, thank you for, for the talks. Uh, my question is for Bridget, and maybe it touches on something that Tom just asked. Uh, and it, the question concerns the relationship between um, the spontaneous character and specifically the spontaneous character of the clustering of, the, of the, a crowd of uh, gawkers and uh, modes of technological reproduction, um, specifically those that were emerging in the 19th century. Um, uh, and, and the question is, how spontaneous is the, is the coalescence, the kind of physical coalescence of a crowd, if arguably it's so highly mediated by technological modes of reproduction? And my example for this really goes uh, back to the Baudelaire, the, eight, the 1863 essay, The Painter of Modern Life, which basically starts in a really fascinating way. It starts with a scene in the Louvre where essentially a, group, a crowd of gawkers go to, to see very familiar works of art. It's principally Titians and Raphaels. But they only go to see those works of art precisely because they've been ma made famous by the engraver's art, which is to say by circulating technologically reproducible images. So I was wondering if the I was wondering if this kind of spontaneous character of the coalescence can actually be complicated slightly by the the pressure of technological reproduction. Hmm. Hmm. Thanks. That's that's an interesting question that I haven't really thought about in those terms before. I think that in the example you gave, I could see I can see that that happening, how reproductive media have have actively shaped these potential gawkers' interests before they find themselves in that situation and channels them in particular directions. Um, but so much of the gawking behavior that is represented in um, the pictures that I've found and gathered has nothing to do with works of art. And so I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking of ways that that would happen, for example, when gawkers gather around you know, um, a suicide or an accident. Of course, I mean, of course, uh, Journalism comes in after the fact, right? So there is there is reporting, and there is uh, eventually even photographs. Um, but that's that doesn't affect the spontaneity of the crowd forming in the moment as it happens. Um, so I'm going to have to think about that further. Thanks, Andre. Thank you all three. I think another great, great panel with lots of interconnections. And I, I, I want to shift perspective just a little bit from uh, away from the Flaneur and the Badeau and towards what these figures are actually looking at and whether there isn't a, a, a more systematic way to frame and to characterize it. Because I, I think what has not changed over the 150 years is, the, is, a, is an art form and forms of spectatorship that are uh, is always seeking the excessively topical, that are always after the new, after the news, um, that are uh, always, if we go back over Baudelaire's lists of things and Benjamin's lists of things, right, we are always traveling in the, in the realm of the political, new media, social media, cinema, mass spectacle. We are at, at transport and transportation hubs, right? There's, there's no, hardly any difference between Kaibot at the Gar Saint Lazare and you man going to the Port Authority, right? And, and so um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if that kind of coherence of subject matter almost is, is, is a necessity or, or if it can be broadened. Um, and, and maybe the, the, the more specific questions for each of you would, would sound a bit like that. So, so, so Tom, the, uh, one of the things that has fallen out of the list, right, and that was so central for Benjamin, is the, is the public-private mm -hmm. uh, exterior, interior, mm -hmm. uh, the domestic interior question, right? And that seems to have completely fallen out of the more contemporary flanurial uh, practices, right? And what, what might that be about, right? Do we, do we not... Uh, does, does the private no longer hold any kind of promise um, uh, at this moment? Right? And then, Bridget, I was wondering whether the, 
the, the Bado, whether there isn't a closer connection between the Bado and anarchical culture at that moment, right? Whether the mm -hmm. uh, whether that attraction to scenes that are scenes of violence, but scenes of planted anarchical violence that are coming out of the blue and are sort of really powerful interruptions in the public are, and whether there isn't a closer connection, and and whether the Bado isn't looking specifically at, at pretty much everything of accident and, and newness, but whether there aren't some more emblematic or um, uh, typical contents for the Badu, like, like anarchist intervention. And then man, um, I, I, I want to be really cruel, you know, instead of say, what would, what would, if the Barnes had asked you, leave your cell phone behind, take a piece of paper and some crayons, and we'll drive you for an hour into the bucolic landscape of Pennsylvania, <laughs> would you have just run uh, uh, screaming and said, "I couldn't possibly <laughs> produce any art that way." Right? What would it? What would? What would? An, what would an, a man Bart that look like that had lost? If you had lost your cell phone, it's sort of is my is my question. Right? Is there or is there is there any topic that's that's taboo in your in your social media world? Right? The, do you see what I'm? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll go in reverse order. Uh, yeah, I, I think, well, if the Barnes had presented me with that, I would have said, yeah, let's go right now. Let's take that time, put the phones away. I mean, that's what I did with the students, particularly, because their relationship to their devices is even more pronounced than probably most of the people in this room. So, but I think ultimately it's not, you, know, you can't, th this is embedded in our life. We can't, um, at, at this point, we're beyond the sort of realm of being able to completely not have technology in our lives, right? So what's more interesting to me is how do we exist in relationship to it? So sure, you can take a, a set period of time and say, okay, let's do something for a set period of time without any relationship to technology. And that might be interesting, but then it's ultimately, how does that, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean for, for us as individuals collectively? And how do we, uh, <coughs> bless you, and how do we experience um, art and, and sort of uh, this common experience together? Right? So I, I think to me it's not as much like the parameters by which it might be put upon a project, but more um, what is our experience in relationship to those parameters, whatever they might be. Um, so that's a bit of a dodge, um, but I, I believe that. And I, and I, like, I know that like, for me personally, I tried uh, for many months to tell myself that I was going to not get another smartphone. And ultimately I did. I, I did not have the self-will to completely take that out of my contemporary lifestyle. And I have very mixed feelings about that. But the best that I can do, and I think this is the, with the more recent work with the sound that kind of investigates uh, a psychological and a sort of an emotional state of mind that is detached from the intellectual relationship, but is trying to kind of offset. And I, and I talk about that in, um, in other places about like just recalibrating my mind. And so that I'm not looking at a screen, I'm not mediating my experience th through a screen, but I'm, I'm kind of um, creating vibrations for my, for my body and my mind. And that's not intellectual, but that's purely emotional and sort of psychological, for back, lack of a better phrase. So that's, that's how I would ap approach that particular um, aspect. Can I jump in here? Um, even though I, I know you guys want to answer Andre's question, but um, I just want to talk a little bit more about the smartphone and the way that it's um, changed Flannery, it's something that I've been thinking about. Um, because it seems to be at once really the sort of enemy of the, the possibility of being a flaneur, um, but also kind of like the best tool possible for being a flaneur. And the way that it's an enemy is, you know, if Flannery is sort of about kind of wandering, kind of unstructured wandering and discovery, I mean, think about how often you are using your phone to tell you where to go, to tell you what's the right restaurant in this new neighborhood that you don't know. So there's th th this, this chance of, this, uh, this, the possibility of kind of chance discovery is I mean, of course, you can still do it, but we just don't do it as much. Yeah, and, it, um, and that's a privilege. But I, it's also, you know, such an, I mean, I think the fact that so many people are out there in the world looking and observing things with the idea that you know, I'm going to take a picture of this unusual thing that I see so that I can post it on Instagram or whatever, um, maybe it makes us more 
um, kind of astute observers? Well, I would say, um, I'd say two things, but, but maybe the first thing is to note that um, it seems to me that like the history of Flannery has always been the history of its disappearance. I mean, from the 18, from the mid 19th century, people were already lamenting, you know, well, the really good years for strolling were the 1830s, you know, like that was when you could walk down the boulevard and, you know, it was great. And then, you know, and, and it's just continually like that. It's yeah. always looking back to something that's been lost, you know, I mean, or at least, I mean, that's one trope in this literature. And so I think when we, um, you know, sit here and talk about the way that technology has made certain things impossible. Um, we, we have to recognize that that's itself a kind of um, a vision of modernity that's been around for a very long right. time, that yeah. we're always just a little yeah. too late, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And that, that makes me a little leery of, I mean, while I wouldn't obviously discount the role of technological mediation in this whole story, and I think Hamam brought up an interesting argument, you know, in his question earlier. Um, I, I'm leery of technological determinism in telling us that, you know, um, X is no longer possible because of, you know, the the new regime uh, 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 around. And I and I do think, you know, each each new layer of technology opens like forecloses some things and opens up others. That's like my like. McLuhan-esque optimism breaking through, you know, today. Like, I'll, like, five minutes from now, I'll be more Debordian and pessimistic, but whatever. For now, I've got the <laughs> smiley face. You know? <laughs> Trying to end on an up note, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the Deborah Rain tweets are That's what I've heard. <laughs> I was wondering if I could ask another question. Um, I have two questions for Tom. The first one is, uh, it's quite naive, and it's, it, it's basically, um, was uh, Pereno aware of the kind of imagistic quality of the, of the collapse of actually existing state socialism in 1989, which is so contemporaneous with the, with the images of, uh, and the film, and the, the creation and the formalization, sorry, of uh, certain forms of protest? And the, and the second one is, uh, uh, my second question is, is more sort of theoretical, and it's to do with your sneaking in of the category of the multitude at the end. Um, and I was wondering, like so much of the talk was focused about the, the, the <coughs> historical category of the crowd, which is so uh, internal to the, to the development of capitalist society. Mm -hmm. And the multitude is a kind of strange meta-historical category, uh, mm -hmm. or arguably a kind of strange mm -hmm. meta-historical uh, category. So I was wondering, how do you justify uh, that shift from crowd to multitude? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, in terms of the first question, this very punctual question, um, undoubtedly, the entire generation um, of artists who came of age uh, with Pereno are, are marked by um, the events of, you know, of 89 to 91, m without a doubt. But I do think there's, I do think there's, for me, a very, a, a much more punctual set of responses that are tied to uh, a particular kind of transitional moment in uh, French labor movement, in some ways the 90s as like the, like the last hurrah for a particular French labor movement. Um, and uh, I do think there, 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 are very, um, there are very particular experiences that he has of, of, um, of these mobilizations between 91 and 95, 96 that are really significant for him. Um, and so I do, wanna, I do wanna think about the specificity in that level. I mean, multitude, I don't, you know, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to respond with a, a, a particularly um, adequate theor theorized or philosophical reflection. Uh, I mean, the, 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 I felt the permission to use multitude to sneak it in, in, you know, uh, that in a sense, I'm going to blame Baudelaire, you know, as I do for most things in my life, yeah. my hashish <laughs> addiction, uh, you know, my collection of top hats. Um, <laughs> That you know his his own use of uh, this notion of a a band de multitude, you know, in uh, uh, in the prose poem crowds, um, you know, uh, uh, is how it, it came in. And then yes, by the I mean that's something. Whether at the end I'm I'm 
really developing a Negrian usage? No, I don't think I could really make that excuse, uh, or I don't think I could really make that claim. I think that that in, 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 you know I'm not using it in that rigorous a way. But, but since it's a very private exchange, sorry, you want to yes. open it up a little Please. bit. Please. No. Oh me. Yeah. You could <laughs> Look, I mean, well, well ultimately, ul yeah. Okay, sure. I mean, I guess I mean the question <laughs> essentially is about the what is the nature of the collective that I'm I'm saying is called forth and and finds representation in uh, in Pereno's work. And I guess I would say it is neither the um, you know, grand, unified, monolithic, working class uh, uh, coming to its own self-consciousness, uh, you know, modality of 20th century Marxist thinking, mm -hmm. but nor is it going to be a, um, nor is it yet this postmodern, um, you know, uh, uh, post-communist notion of multitude. I really am committed to this. I am interested in exploring um, and, and rely in this paper on a, um, a model developed by a French political philosopher, Jacques Ranciere, that wants to insist that the, the particular nature of the crowd isn't in its coherence and unity, but is in what it divides. You know that the crowd is continually in the operation of of driving wedges between things, between itself and the state, and then internal to itself. It's always in this continual process of disaggregation and disunity. Um, that I find to be a particularly interesting uh, and vital model, and I think it it also is one that helps me to see those works. I mean, I'll admit that it's not driven by my commitment to a political ideal, but driven to a commitment to trying to understand these strange objects and, and, and practices. It's pretty difficult to embrace it as a political ideal. Where we are now. Mm. Yeah, that's a... <laughs> where are we now? <laughs> so just a question for you. Uh, two questions. Um, first, uh, Bridget, thank you very much for your talk and the, uh, the, the artwork, The Accident struck me very strongly. And uh, my first question is, um, to what extent is the accident the scene of the accident, or is it the action, is the crowd the accident? Because the, um, because the crowd has a temporal transience, right? It's not a stationary object. So to some extent, the, the crowd itself is the accident. And, and to follow up on that, um, I'm an orchestra conductor. So when I look at a score, there's a process of reduction and then a process of expansion. Because it's impossible for me to take it all in at once and create something out of it. And my reaction to the discussions of um, Flannery and the crowd um, is that there's an act of reduction, but without the consequential act of re-expansion for, there's like a de-democratization almost of talking about the crowd. I would love to hear your thoughts about both of these things. I might have to ask you to expand on the latter point to be a little bit more specific. Well, and this is not directed on? just at you, it's for, for oh, all okay. of you. Well, maybe someone else can take up that one. Well, I, mean, I, think, I think this is actually, I think that your, your terms are actually precisely mirroring uh, Baudelaire's own in the 1860s. I mean, Baudelaire himself talks about, um, I mean, his, his whole oeuvre is, is structured around modes of condensation and dispersion. And certainly the, the flaneur entails both. The flaneur entails first an Im that, that immersion into the bath of the city the, uh, and, and that, um, that breaking down of ego boundaries to um, identify yourself with this vast array of, of, of people that you're swimming within. But then it's countered by a second moment, always, of condensation, of, of the, the way that that dispersion then results in a, a strengthening, a return to ego boundaries, and maybe even a, a reinforcement of the ego boundaries. Uh, 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 so, you know, that, that po almost pulsation is key to a, a, mo a modernist literary aesthetic for, for Baudelaire, certainly. So I think that's, uh, it's, it's very, the two ends are really operative here. 
Right. And, th and that reconsolidation of the self is precisely what does not happen in the theorization of the Sado, both in the theoretical discussions of it and in pictures of it. Um, and I think that's the most fundamental difference, is that it, you don't ultimately resolve back into an individual subjectivity that's secure. Right, uh, definitely it's like blowing up a, an image that's already been enlarged. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, in, in response to your question about the, uh, is the accident, the, the crowd itself, uh, I don't know if, if Ancron was thinking that poetically in, in his titling, but I would certainly agree that that is, some, is an ambiguity that the picture proposes and that's in line with the way that I read it and that uh, it's clearly not, the picture's clearly not, as I said, really about the accident, it's about the reaction to the accident and the way the crowd gathers, and it's very much playing with um, questions of, of spontaneity and, and coalescence um, in the in the technique and in the way that the crowd is forming. So, um, and spontaneity uh, is is accidental. I think that that's. I think he's really playing with the relationship there. Um, yeah. Um, thank you all so much for these again, enlightening presentations. I have a uh, quick question for Bridget and then one for Man. Um, Bridget, I, I may just be rehearsing Andre's question from before that you didn't get to answer. To answer it, sure. um, mm -hmm. Sorry, that's but, my fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also was struck by this question of what unites what the Bado looked at, because it seems like it could really be such a diverse uh, set of events, not, and not necessarily objects, but really events. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about violence and celebrity. We've also spoken about art as being a, a fodder for gawking. Um, I, I think of natural beauty. I was recently in Jamaica, where mm -hmm. I'm not joking, like 10,000 people came to one specific spot to see a sunset, even though you could see the sunset from wherever. Um, so I, so I wonder, you know, and you talk about the emotional connection um, with the Bado as opposed to the sort of more intellectual dis distance relationship of the Sano. So is there an emotion that runs through that connects the experience of the Bado? Is it the sublime? Because um, I think that to me connects both the fear and the beauty. So we're talking about Burke. Um, so I, I just wonder if you have any thoughts on if, if there is any unifying principle. Yeah, it's a very big and important question. I mean, I think that there is no, there's no big or unifying principle to gawking as a phenomenon mm -hmm. in modern life. <laughs> um, but, um, and I don't think that was true then, or is it true now? I mean, people gawk at whatever they find fascinating or disturbing or alarming, and that can change in time and place for various cultural reasons um, in all kinds of ways. So what I can look at as a art historian is what um, writers and artists tend to focus on when they're talking about or picturing gawkers. And there are recurrent themes, but there's, no, there's certainly no unifying emotion or no theme that dominates all the others. Um, and since I'm focusing in particular on the late 1880s and 1890s, a very um, frequent focus is the politicized crowd. Um, and that didn't come through today because I didn't uh, focus on the artists in my project who tend to be more interested in the political and anarchist crowd. And Valafon is certainly one of them. So you just saw him very, very briefly. Um, but Valafon, who, um, who was thought to have anarchist leanings, um, we're not very sure about precisely how anarchist he was, but he traveled in those circles, um, and he certainly uh, depicts various anarchist situations in his prints. Um, so there's, and there's a, there's a lot of that in crowd scenes in the 1890s because there's a lot of anarchist activity in the 1890s. So it's on people's minds and it's being reported on. Um, and there's also, there's, there are also, there's also a lot of um, activity in Parisian nightlife with these, these dance halls and cabarets. So it's just whatever is, culturally dominant at the moment and on people's minds uh, will tend to get represented in these scenes of gawking behavior. And I think it really changes from time to place. But the political um, subject matter uh, for gawking in general in, the, in this period in Fin de Siècle France is, is major. Um, and just it just wasn't a major feature of the, the two artists that I focus on I today. also wonder if Goya features in your, in your, or if you're really just focusing on France because I feel that 
you from other artists where the crowd and the figure, the, the notion of gawking is yes. so dominant. That yeah, <laughs> no, he's certainly an interesting one. I mean, this topic, as I've, I've said to, to many people, it's, it's, it's infinitely expansive yeah. as a topic. And it, uh, in order to be finishable by me in my life, <laughs> um, it needs to be fairly radically you know, focused sure. on certain case studies. And so I, I spend time looking at a lot of these you know, comparable um, artists in, in other time periods and cultures, and they really help me think. But I am focusing primarily on this moment in late 19th century France where there's a real kind of explosion of these kinds of images in a certain small community of artists um, and the relationship of that to the emergence of, of crowd psychology. And, um, but it could certainly go in many other directions. And Nan, my question for you was about the line, or it could be to everyone and even the earlier panelists, about the line between flannery and voyeurism. Mm -hmm. um, I was really struck by the Sophie Fall piece uh, in the exhibition and this sort of stalking <laughs> modality that we see. And I, I mean, your presentation, I was really interested in the Nine Eyes Google search project um, that to me was disturbing mostly on account of the fact that none of these people knew they were being watched and then, you know, photographed or watched <coughs> and then taken a screenshot of. Mm. Um, so I just wonder for you in your own work, um, do those considerations come into play? Yeah, I mean, it's, I have an obligation um, to take care of whatever audience I'm working with. Um, oh, and, and when I say take care, I mean like to not uh, exploit them. Um, and that is something that I struggled with with the performances for sure, because you kind of, you put someone into a situation and they can choose to watch or not um, if they're following <laughs> online or if I'm going up to someone in Port Authority, what, what agency am I giving them if I'm asking them and what is that relationship to then how that will be used in the performance. Um, and I think my overall kind of guiding principle is to um, just be as empathetic and sympathetic and conscious as I can um, with whatever I'm attempting to do in that moment. And increasingly, though, that's looked a lot more like inward facing. So I'm, it's, which is not to say that I'm less interested in, in the crowd now, but I'm, I'm equally interested in what is, how can I interpret on a personal level my relationship to um, time and space and, and my experiences online. Um, and I think in doing that, it kind of, uh, it saved me from me <laughs> not knowing how to work with an audience better and, and because I don't trust myself, um, to be perfectly honest. And because the relationship with the ego and the performer um, to when you're in a space and you're um, holding a space, um, I'm in a place now where I don't trust that I have the, the best intentions with the work. Um, and that's to be like brutally honest um, about that particular relationship that I have. Um, Thank you. I think that we need to um, wrap up. So um, I want to thank you all for coming. And I really want to thank our, all of our speakers again for your just incredible presentations. Thank you, guys. Thank you.